so uh, good morning everyone uh, welcome to the journal club of this month we have uh, fetched out four nice uh, recent articles which would probably have a some effect on our clinical practice uh, i would like gaurav to share his screen gaurav you are presenting the first one yes sir and we have uh, dr vidisha kulkarni a senior uh, pediatric orthopedic and uh, deformity correction surgeon with her key interest in upper extremity corrections and deformities and uh, we also have uh, taral uh, taral with us taral does not need any introduction and their presence will give a valued input uh, in current today's paper so i invite gaurav to start uh, the journal club yeah so good morning everyone and i hope i am audible and visible to all yep yeah so uh, the first disclaimer is that everybody should be 100% attentive for this because it's a bit difficult to imbibe so the topic of uh, this article is estimating skeletal maturity by segmental linear modeling of key antero posterior knee radiographic parameters so this is a new method to estimate skeletal maturity by a single ap x ray of the knee this study was done in rainbow mother and children's hospital cleveland and so we know that gruelic and pile bone age atlas and tanner white house staging system are the two most commonly used methods for estimating skeletal age now the disadvantage of these methods is that they have a steep learning curve and high inter observer variability and they require an additional x ray of the hand and left hand and wrist apart from the x ray of the area of interest that is knee whenever we are doing growth or uh, limb length assessment we need the limb x rays apart from that we need hand and wrist x rays also for this so using a system that utilizes available knee radiographs reduces the healthcare cost decreases patient radiation exposure and improves clinical efficiency roche weiner and thiessen method that is rwt method is all was already developed in 1975 it is also a method of assessing skeletal maturity using knee radiographs however it was very good for research but it is impractical to use to use clinically because it requires measurement of 36 distinct knee parameters now modified fells knee system maturity system was adapted from the rwt method by isolating seven out of the 36 key parameters to assess skeletal maturity and it was found that it is more accurate than the gruelic and piles bone age atlas system so these are the seven parameters which are measured and on the basis of this skeletal maturity is assessed so the one is fem k which indicates capping of the lateral distal femoral epiphysis over the metaphysis second is fem l which is fusion of the lateral distal femoral physis fib fib a which is ratio of proximal fibular epiphysial width to the metaphysial width tib a which is the ratio of proximal tibial epiphysial width to the metaphysial width tib n which is the capping of the lateral proximal tibial epiphysis over the metaphysis tib p which is the capping of medial proximal tibial epiphysis over the metaphysis and tib q which is the fusion of the lateral proximal tibial physis so these are the seven parameters which are assessed and then the skeletal maturity is calculated now the hypothesis of our paper is that at different time points of skeletal maturation subsets of these seven parameters are more or less useful in skeletal age estimation than the others so they are trying to reduce these seven to further less so that this system becomes more simpler and the purpose of this study was to determine if the application of computer 
adaptive testing principles could minimize the time required to apply the modified fells knee skeletal maturity system without losing the accuracy so they use this bolton brush collection which is a historical data set of a large scale longitudinal human growth study to assess quantitative and qualitative characteristics of knee radiographs associated with skeletal maturity this large scale study contains serial annual x rays of healthy middle to upper class white children living in greater cleveland area between 1926 to 1942 so every year these children were x rayed as a uh, just for a serial assessment and depending on the x rays and additional data like child's height sex and age the skeletal maturity was assessed so what was the standard of this study was that longitudinal growth data which was used to determine the age associated with 90% final height so they tried to assess that at what time 90% final height was assessed uh, achieved by using these x rays these x rays were of the patients of peripubertal age group in males it was 9 to 17 and in females it was 7 to 15 there were 78 patients which included 326 radiographs these included 41 girls and 37 boys now rwt method calculates predicted skeletal maturity from a linear combination of 36 parameters as discussed previously these include 18 tibial parameters 12 femur parameters and 6 fibular parameters but this modified fells knee skeletal maturity system this simplified this 36 parameter system to a 7 parameter system segmented linear regression analysis was performed on these remaining 7 parameters to create models for estimating skeletal age now what this study has done this study has used these seven parameters in different combinations to assess what few parameters out of these seven are the best to assess maturity and these parameter the parameters identified as significant by step wise linear regression were included in a generalized estimation equation analysis so these are all statistical and computation terms which were used uh, methods which were used to assess the significance of which parameters to be used the resulting models were used to determine how well the estimated skeletal age compared with the true skeletal age for each subject visit and they also calculated the percentage of outlier estimates outliers were those that were more than 1 year off from the actual skeletal age so they calculated how many were of the uh, uh, normal uh, parameters so uh, in result there were 326 radiographs from 78 patients 41 girls with 172 x rays with a mean chronological age of 11.1 years and 37 boys with 152 x rays with a mean chronological age of 12.9 years were evaluated each patient had a mean of 4.2 plus minus 1.5 x rays now the results so they use this segmented regression and uh, equation analysis indicating that this this indicated that fewer radiographic knee parameters were required for each of the abbreviated system now abbreviated system is a modification of this modified fells system where they used four patterns these were the four patterns the modified fells system by sex modified fells system by age modified fells system by femk and sex and modified fells system by age and sex so they used com combination of those parameters in these four forms and they compared them with the complete modified fells knee system and with the grulick and pile bone atlas to see how they performed they found that each of these 
abbreviated system uh, uh, i mean the fewer uh, radiographic parameters were required for each of these four combinations and correlation of these four systems with the true skeletal age was higher than the gp system and was comparable to the complete modified felt system they also found that the average discrepancies from the true skeletal age were lesser than the gp system but not significantly different from the modified felt's knee system and the percentage of outlier estimates made by these abbreviated systems what was not significantly different from the gp system or the mfks system modified felt system so they found out that this was doing better than the gp system in all ways and was comparable to the modified felt knee system without with lesser number of parameters so these were the four patterns they used now to discuss the the uh, they worked on this possibility that some of these seven knee parameters may be more effective than the others at different stages of skeletal maturation these kind of patterns or paradigms has have previously been used in assessing maturation of cervical vertebrae in which the contribution of a particular radiographic parameter may vary based on the maturation stage of the cervical vertebrae similar systems were used for the diagnostic performance of using certain dental maturation stages to predict skeletal maturity and this study suggests an analogous effect in knee development so by identifying and applying the only the most important parameters to each patient accurate skeletal age estimation can be obtained more efficiently so these this is the uh, decision tree for abbreviated modified felt knee system they are showing uh, that for males and females with femk has got stages femoral uh, capping system 0 1 for males it is different for females it is different and for these 0 1 and 2 they used these remaining parameters for 0 age and tib a for 1 age tib a tib b so these in these ways they use these different parameters in different combinations to find out which of them works best and more most accurately so so with this kind of system they reduce these sorry they reduce these seven parameters to just these two majorly these two parameters along with the age and sex and uh, and created a skeletal maturity assessment system which is equally accurate to this seven parameter system and better than the grulick and piles bone age atlas so uh, each of the each of those four patterns of abbreviated skeletal maturity system demonstrated comparable accuracy to the modified felt knee system while requiring less than seven parameters they also found that modified felt knee segmented by femk and sex so out of these four the system which included femk and sex was the optimal model with respect to speed and accuracy of skeletal age estimation this model requires clinician to measure as few as two and at the most three parameters per radiograph this model uses only five of the original seven parameters for all combinations of sex and femk grading so within 30 seconds by measuring those two parameters and the age and sex of the child these things can be integrated uh, can be incorporated into a mobile app and the skeletal age assessment can be done so to summarize this abbreviated system can be impl implemented with just two to three radiographic parameters to estimate skeletal maturity more accurately than the gp bone age atlas it has been integrated into a free mobile app named what's the skeletal maturity which is available in both ios and android however they still recommend full seven parameter system for final surgical planning until further validation of this abbreviated system has been done however the potential for this extremely rapid implementation of a abbreviated system makes it the system of choice for estimating maturity at opd setting so my critical comments are that the validation of this system is pending 
it is mostly computation based and it takes generalized estimate it might not take into account individual variations and there is a learning curve uh, in calculating these parameters in my practice i was using multiplier method and soft grains method there are a lot of these methods i still don't know which is the best and which is, which should be used or what combination should be used and i think we need a study of indian patients because most of these systems are english and there is a lot of variation in uh, maturity of them and ours so we need a indian system and uh, i'll try to use this along with the soft grain and multiplier and see how it correlates uh, with these thank you and this is open for discussion yeah so <clears throat> goro that was nicely read a uh, complex paper vidisha i invite you to comment on this or yeah. question on this yeah um i congratulate gauro for nicely presenting this complicated uh, topic of evaluation of bone age biological bone age rather uh, there are good old methods like gp tw method but i what i learn from this paper is that this is a very good adjuvant Uh, to evaluate the bone age maturity from single knee joint ap x ray and especially the uh, abbreviated knee scale is uh, less time consuming more accurate in comparison with the older methods like gp and tw and i find it useful uh, this method and i will try and use this method in evaluation of skeletal maturity uh thank you thank you ma'am yeah so uh tarol is i think scrub but you know the few things which caught my attention is first of all now this comparison of data that bolt and something data which was collected between 1926 and 1942 now we see due to environmental factors the children are getting mature earlier so the chronologic age for instance what we have observed that mothers who are uh, uh, the the girls who are getting their periods it's about a year earlier than their mothers so are we uh, we are not considering environmental factors over last 50 60 years and that's why this uh, assessment of maturity can uh, you know it it can be detrimental now that can that factor has to be considered that's one the second thing is uh, they have to standardize x rays first of all no if uh, the knee is not in uh, complete extension or bit in hyper extension then we may find the obliteration of growth plate you know even though they are open so that happens uh, even if we take a standing x ray or a supine x ray in some you will find that growth plate is open and in some other uh, you will find growth plate is obliterated so they should also mention what is the standard knee x ray you know it's a supine standing a bit with knee flexion or what because without standardization you know there are chances of a lot of fallacies in measuring and finally you know what i feel is everywhere uh, they are kind of bypassing human assessment and that's known as artificial intelligence so all these uh, engineering uh, bioengineering students are involved and they want to bypass that you just put an x ray here and we'll tell you with the age and how much growth is remaining and what is the time of so it is very uh, generalized uh, without assessing the uh, fallacies without assessing the patient's maturity if they have some endocrine conditions you know so this can be an adjunct but we have to be very critical in take obtaining a good quality standard x ray first of all and then to individualize that's what i uh, feel and uh, in clinical practice you know more and more complex methods coming up uh, its utility gets compromised yes taral your comments Or yeah. Gaurav, you so, want to say so, something on so this? What I mean? The whole thing, advantage of this system, no? Molin, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Molin. 
yeah i can hear you we can hear okay. you tarun so the advantage of this method see well, the, the most important application of skeletal age for an orthopedic surgeon is to do growth modulation around the knee either it is for genu algum or for limb length discrepancy because you really want to know whether your system is going to work or not work now traditionally we have been doing, doing hand or elbow x rays the problem is the upper limb and lower limb growth don't match spine and lower limb growth don't match similarly upper limb and lower limb growth don't match. we have enough number of cases where elbow so shows fusion but knee is open and vice versa now if you can base uh, do a skeletal maturity on knee x ray it, it saves you a elbow or hand x and that was the basic pretext on which this system was developed and then these systems when they came up they were very complicated you know as uh, goro rightly mentioned there were seven parameters and, and and there were many more so from many more they came down to seven and from seven they come down to two which you can do in 30 seconds i think there is a good idea about uh, if all of us are patients where we are doing group modulation and and along with elbow study this also and see the correlation i see it will be a study you know this is a very specific but very good under good quality digital exhibit is not difficult in today's scenario so thanks for goro presenting it's not a very easy system to understand but i think if we can have a short uh, workshop like thing for half an hour you know in exposicon you know and people will get on to doing this so that would be my take on this thanks right right so, thanks goro let's move on to the other paper and uh, further comments goro if you have you can uh, post yeah, I in just, i just want to by the time uh, who is the second presenter please share your screen chinmay yeah yeah goro your comments yeah just one small comment that they had a bigger sample set and they excluded a lot of patients because of improper x rays so they have got standard x rays but then they have not defined what is a standard x ray and in what position they have taken those so you can write to the authors you know that like, uh, we had this journal sir and we we found it interesting kindly let us know what are the standard you can also ask that uh, have you considered these environmental factors you know which might have uh, you know because for one x ray in 1926 there might be lot of growth remaining but for the same child in today's world will finish the mature uh, the growth very quickly you know absolutely fine it was a uh, good paper yeah chinmay please yeah. start good morning all uh, myself dr chinmay uh, i'm presenting a paper which was published in jco 2014 a paper was conducted in italy the title of the paper is subtalar extra articular screw arthrosis for the treatment of flexible flat foot in a children so as we know the most of the time in a clinical practice the uh, the patient or the parents didn't come with the complaint of flexible flat foot they come with the complaint of the untied uh, the their children's foot appearance or excessive asymmetric shoe wear then we come then we uh, come with a scientific language that the low or absent arch with excessive eversion of heel with abducted forefoot producing a midfoot sac which defined we as at a flexible flat foot on a clinical examination we ask children to do a tiptoe standing or a elevating a first metatarsal uh, first metatarsal to see if uh, see if there any uh, appearance of the arch or non weight bearing so similarly there are some concept that if there is a tight ta over user tibialis posterior it will cause uh, the flat foot for which we do a physiotherapy and most of the time these children do well so we mostly mostly go for the conservative treatment and plus minus we can use sometimes the orthosis but if the child has a persistent flat foot which now complaining of a um, pain which was happened due to the continuous walking on the medial uh, medial uh, walking on the medial side of the foot then this paper is useful the aim of this paper is the uh, to analyze the technique and the outcome the procedure has a low complication rate low surgical risk and is reversible case uh, in case of failure so in material methods this uh, uh, they collected the data from 1990 to 2012 so there are total 485 patient which was again divided into male and female and the indi uh, the indication for the inclusion criteria are the pes teno valgus and pes calcaneus valgus they uh, they uh, excluded all the pathological condition like the cerebral palsy tarsal coalition the post traumatic and other things 
to uh, to analyze the outcome uh, very well uh, they further subdivided that population into uh, more concise uh, pattern so they do they do reverse crew at 3.1 years so they have a total 138 patient up to 27 feet out of this 227 feet they have a 76 patient of 1 to 1 feet with an average age of 13.5 uh, with a standard deviation of 1.80 in which the screw removal was uh, done at the 2.9 years so they assess the all the functional outcome assessment on the form of uh, x rays and the uh, the foot parameters in a clinical assessment they do a footprint analysis in a pre operative in a x ray uh, in x ray measurement they do uh, go for the costobartani angle the talus inclination angle and the calcaneal pitch all these angles are measured pre operatively and at post operatively similarly after, at the time of screw removal and after the screw removal so speaking about the technique they described that uh, once you find uh, once you reduce the talo calcaneal d rotation by inverting the foot and making the incision at the sinus tarsi and they place the screw in superior inferior direction to lock uh, that the in a such a manner that the head of the screw is uh, is against the lateral process of the talus so it will block the tal uh, calcaneus going into the eversion so by this uh, they try to maintain the uh, calcane uh, calcaneum and talus in a neutral position so uh, speaking about the results on a three uh, three month post operatively the most significant finding they found that the creeping was substantially increase in uh, post screw placement because they give the uh, i will explain uh, into the subsequent slide so these are the clinical assessment after the screw removal we can see there is a uh, there is a nice arch has developed after the screw placement the uh, on the x ray the uh, the costobartani angle was significantly improved similarly the taral inclination angle the costobartani and taral inclination angle are improved because of the uh, position of the screw in that particular anatomical zone calcaneal pitch was improved over the period of time because of the these two uh, parameters are coming to the normal range they do speak about the complication the uh, the complication they uh, they found after uh, some of the uh, some of the patient they have Uh, uh the complication in the form of uh, joint effusion and decreased range of motion so they do a screw removal for this patient in a group b they have a 14 patient which have a contracture of perineal muscle due to antalgic position in pronation for which uh, they uh, go a systemic manner in the form of plantar flexion class physiotherapy and sometimes the steroid injection and group 3 group c they have a three patient which show a stress fracture of fourth metatarsal they thought it is because uh, because of the patient uh, walk on the uh, third and fourth metatarsal once the screw place in first three months but these are the these are the accidental finding on the x ray that show that it is a healed fracture of the uh, most probably the fourth metatarsal because the relatively uh, fifth metatarsal is a flexible so no treatment was given in that patient in a discussion the stahli is uh, uh, in a discussion that they uh, mentioned that the foot after the 10 years are more mature so anything doing before the 10 years it will cause the screw will pull out or screw will migrate it so they uh, try to get the time as much as possible in the form of physiotherapy and do all the procedure after the age of 10 years the the principle of this paper was that it works on the principle of the calculum stop mechanism so it will cause that the foot should not go into the eversion so it will place in a neutral position why this uh, why this uh, screw position is important in a subtalar region because the the proprioception the nerve endings around the sinus tarsi cause uh, ca causes the foot arch bentness it acts on a principle that once you reduce the joint once you reduce the joint the proprioception and nerve endings uh, uh, work together and uh, maintains the arch of the foot as this uh, as this screw does not allow to, uh, allow the um, calcaneum to go in the eversion again the uh, the costobartani and talus inclination angle was subsequently improved we, these angles are improved which was finally uh, which uh, which eventually caused the calcaneum plinch to improve after the period of some times they do find that the intoing and supination of foot in their some of the patient i think because they happened because of the forward body sensation in their uh, sinus uh, near the sinus tarsi so they walk on the supinated foot and that's why they get the third and fourth metatarsal fracture subsequently but 
after the physiotherapy and after three months, they do uh, do well. So in a limitation of this uh, uh, limitation of this uh, study is that uh, the post-op physiotherapy protocol, if they mention, as they mentioned that there is the possibility of they walk on a supinated foot, the gastroc recession, they do, uh, they specifically mention that they don't go for gastroc recession in their study population. Functional outcome score assessment is important, uh, but as they mentioned that the, the foot function and the overall appearance was good over in the patient, so they don't go for the functional score assessment. Lower limb alignment, uh, if, they are, if they consider the genu valgum or some of the lower limb alignment will cause the uh, flat foot, they didn't consider in that. And when to, scoom, uh, when to remove the screw, is there any particular time limit when they think about to remove the screw or in general, they remove after the three, uh, three years. Implication in our practice, uh, the physiotherapy and pre-counseling is important in this patient because after pulling the screw, patient might walk on the lateral border of the uh, lateral border of the foot. So before uh, before going to the operative, they have to we have to explain to the parents that the uh, the foot should be plantigrade and the uh, subsequent physiotherapy should be thought before the uh, going into the intervention. And uh, uh, the screw placement should be uh, idle as the uh, the head of the screw should be lie against the lateral process of the talus or below or below it. So it can block the eversion of that uh, calcaneum. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so I'm just having a foot model with me to clarify. Now, this is a club foot model. Let me create a plano valgoid thing, you know? So it's like this, uh, if I, I hope full. So when we evert, the sinus tarsi is a bit obliterated. Chinma, you have seen this surgery, so that, that's yes. why I'm asking you. So they put screw, uh, where they put the screw from? Uh, so they go to the, uh, just lateral to the talar head, lateral process of the talus. Okay. In supero, anti, supero inferior direction. So it's, they start from between the, uh, the anterior and middle facet of calcaneum. Yes, yes, sir. And, right? and that's... Off. Okay. Go from superior inferior. And go from superior inferior. So how much prominence of that screw is? Sir, so they intraoperatively they assess the hinge foot alignment, sir. Okay. So once once you see that they mention about the uh, the malleolar sign, if the reduction is good, then you can see both the malleoli. Yeah, I learned that. So what what I want to say is like if the screw head is uh, coming underneath the uh, the lateral uh, teller body then it will be kind of uh, un under correction isn't it can you uh, show the x-ray uh, can you show the x-ray in your presentation yes gaurav you want to say something yes sir i wanted to know how this is different from the most commonly used hyprocure screw the 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 screw which is introduced by graham et al as they say that that is the third generation screw and that is inserted into the sinus tarsi with no prominence. I have seen a few cases with a foot and ankle surgeon and it's a quite a good system. So I just wanted okay. to know how this screw is different from that and what is the advantage or I mean difference. Right. Like let's, uh, that's a valid question and we'll, we'll take it subsequently. So first of all, I just want to clarify that how this surgery is working for the fellows. You know? So as we can see on this x-ray, it's in a supero inferior direction going through the sinus tarsi and it just lies underneath the uh, lateral lateral process of the talus. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So our, earlier on, it would be like this, uh, the lateral process and then they correct it and then they put the screw in, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, it's paper is open for discussion. Vidisha, what's your, what are your comments? Uh, yeah, till in our institute, till now we are treating flexible flat foot conservatively with arch supports and all that. And this paper is showing uh, data of almost 485 patients treated with this CESAR technique for yeah. improving the hind foot position as well as improvement of the radiological parameters. Uh, but it is not compared with the uh, control group 
or conservatively yes. treated patients so i am a little bit uh, skeptical whether to imply this procedure in our clinical practice uh, second thing what i learned is that uh it is important to take plantar view to see both the malleoli and if there is under correction pull out the screw and if there is over correction insert the screw further deep but i don't know exactly what is the required length of the screw above the calcaneal surface to optimize this modality yeah so, yeah, so like yeah. um so first of all uh we a pediatric orthopedic uh, surgeons our practice is limited till 18 years and uh, we have been told that the hyperligamentous laxity is responsible for flat feet and how you can change the uh, the laxity by doing some operation or putting some inserts and so uh, we have not been offering surgeries so to this patients because uh, we say that uh, you just stretch heel core and reduce your weight and things would be fine but we have adult colleagues who have been doing this surgery very frequently so we do not exactly know the natural history of flexible flat feet or can we do something from now to so that we can change the net there are few tape couple of papers which has shown a very short term uh, uh, follow up on this so based on those papers these uh, these colleagues are doing uh, uh, this uh, intervention now this patient this study is 700 patients now there is a paper about 1500 patients of flat feet from europe and they have used some similar device so uh, what important uh, part i learned this that even after removal of, of screw the patients maintained the arch and angles and some of those patients have correction on opposite side as well yeah and they they term it as a pro proprioception theory so i am uh, uh, i want to uh, you know experience this but as a uh, chinmay i we had a discussion with chinmay that the team from san diego they visited italy to see uh, in their center and and once they were happy they started doing it in their uh, center now we have uh, we know that that uh, dennis wenger has done a study that there is no effect of university of california orthosis in correcting flat feet that was a very robust and well uh, proclaimed study and if the same institute is starting practicing this then there should be some uh, validity into it yes taral you have operated upon this patient uh, can i add uh, yeah, yeah 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 so i have done few of these exactly four in numbers now mm -hmm. i'll answer few of these questions you know karo uh, ask about what is the difference between the third generation devices and this one so this is a device which goes intra osseous into the calcaneum and the proud screw occupies the space in the sinostarsi between calcaneum and talus so it is a point contact and it works as it said in paper by proprioception and by physical positioning and also by pain so some of these devices can be painful the mm. third generation devices actually go into the sinostarsi they are conical devices the conical devices with a screw which is held in the sinostarsi and it it opens up the sinus tarsus we really don't know what happens to the movement of the subtalar joint with this device mm. there are two indications for using this in cp this technique actually was popularized in brazil now between brazil and spain there are deep connections because mm. of same language and same origin and that's why whatever is practiced in some part of europe will also be practiced in brazil Yeah. and that's why these were very popular for cp now the problems which i have found in children with the use of this screw is one is to find the right side of screw so most of the screw cancellor screws if you see here are required here can, can cancellor screw will be 24 26 we really don't get those in imported implants you get in indian implants second thing because the bone in child is very poorly has poor cancellor trabeculae this thing and if this thing they will not work yeah to put it 
it's a task you really have to invert hmm. the subtalar joint and then pass it at the right direction because it's it's not very easy to pass this screws and that's why people moved on to simpler methods like you know the method which uh, was mentioned by gaurav it is made so dumb idiot proof that even hmm. podiatrist uh, and people do it in opd basis you know with a small cr under local anesthesia hmm. uh, the problem is we really don't know what is the need for such procedures you know hmm. as somebody one of the pediatric orthopedic surgeon rightly mentioned the indications for these procedures are indications for non operative hmm. and and what these procedures cannot do you require you know a calcaneum lengthening or other procedures like osteotom the failure rate with this procedure is also little high so in countries where insurance pays for these procedures you know people have been doing it in a big number uh, because they are uh, they are all market driven we really don't know what is the utility of this procedure and efficacy of yeah And that's why it's not very popular in india no we'll only know from our foot and ankle colleagues you know who are market driven right now who are doing lot of these procedures you know what will be the actual success rate we'll know from them when the patients come to you for implant removal you will know now uh, thank you saral my question is for symptomatic flexible flat feet you know uh, some of those in last 15 years i have operated two or three and i have done calcaneal lengthening procedures so how calcaneal lengthening like just we do in mosca is different than this you know or how this implant would be better than our conventional calcaneal lengthening oh it's totally different uh, mosca has a completely different biomechanical basis it aligns both the metatarsal joints it also lengthens peroneus Long muscles. Me for lengthening osteotomy are different. We use it mainly in neuromuscular feet. I, no, I know, I know that. But what if we use this in a flexible flat feet because they have similar kind of uh, skeletal deformity, and the pain is not because of prominence of talar head. Pain is because of lateral impingement. Now, if the talar head is well supported by elongated lateral calcaneum, then it would act as the same. Uh, we can recreate the arch so the question is how these implants are superior than uh, just doing lengthening procedure so there are indications that will be different so that's yeah yeah so indications are completely different i i agree indication i'm what i'm telling is what if we use conventional surgeries which are done in cp and neuromuscular in symptomatic flexible flat feet i i see gap between a conservative treatment and uh, and an osteotom the problem is we don't know the gap is wide or narrow the gap is that indications for conservative treatment and calcaneal lengthening procedure leave a very narrow gap for procedures to be used the problem is the company and some of the foot and ankle surgeons are trying to widen the gap meaning they are going to impinge on some of the patient which will be inevitably and require procedure all they will also impinge on patients which have structural correction of the foot and processes will be used as in this case i hope uh, in my point of view is clear only time Actually, will tell us there is a lot of voice breakage uh, taral we might uh, like to listen to your commentary you know on fellows group you know if you have when you get time you know you can uh, send a, a a voice message we, your voice is cutting so we are not able to understand anyways gaurav you what you want to say yeah sir so i wanted to say that these procedures specifically the the one which i was talking about has got a limited indication i mean uh, the angles are strictly measured and the there is a only a particular range in which these methods are effective if the deformity is more than that then they they are not that effective and you need to do uh, calcaneum lengthening 
so that is so one the question big is you know for the milder deformity it is more of a cosmetic issue than functional issue right so the question is if we are correcting their cosmesis does it have implication in their future do they yeah. uh, i mean there should be a longitudinal study or to say that doing this surgery is now i realize that this implant which the new company is bringing it's costing 45000 rupees right sir for just single screw yes sir so if i start doing it from tomorrow i see daily three flat feet patients right to so mera data bhi itna hi ho jayega lekin whether it has any effect on natural history you know we need to yes raman says that we did just, two feet just, yeah just one it. just one comment so what these foot and ankle surgeon say that in long run if the feet is plano valgoid or reverted it causes uh, you know, posterior tibial tendon dysfunction or pttd yeah. and later degeneration of that tendon which may later cause pain and biomechanical difference and this and that but we really don't know the ah, evidence so the question is how many percentage of these patients would develop that arthritic changes right and then comes cost effectiveness for instance you know if you want to prevent one brachial plexus birth palsy you have to do 267 c sections right sir so the cost effectiveness of c section is not there and that's why we have to keep on treating obpps we cannot do c section for every child similarly if we keep on correcting the flexible flat foot in a fear that this will lead to arthritis we don't know what is exact percentage exactly sir anyway so you. we are going to goa and we'll discuss this will be brainstorming on this the dr johar is also there and is a very molin uh, so last words i want to say is this is very highly market driven procedure if you see the website understand. they have they have listed the doctors and the way see never in life we have been taken to goa to learn a technique at I the know, company's I told, expense i told i told the same thing to this so it's it's very common in uh, adult trauma now in pediatric ortho we are like we we have never seen this luxury but there's all market driven i am not going to be in this trap i want to have real answers you know why i'm going is dr johari is also interested that and anyways so raman is saying we did two flat feet in non neuromuscular symptomatic cases by lateral lengthening and medial cuneiform osteotomy along with medial plication so raman do you have follow up on those and how did they behave later yeah sir actually uh, i am really fortunate to work with uh, three foot and ankle surgeons here and two of them are doing the cases in pediatric as well as in adults too yeah and in this last one year we have operated on plenoval goid feet a number of times and they not, they never even talk about putting a screw for plenoval goid foot okay so never put uh, arthrorhizis they don't do yeah yeah they never they didn't ever even talk about it why so you must ask them yeah i am going to ask them about this question yeah, so, uh, they are they are very experienced foot and ankle surgeons and if this is a new technique which is going to work for these children they must have been doing this frequently but i, I they agree with you uh, so the it. see the it is edmonton and the canada and they are highly influenced by uh, link sahelis paper and work you know from seattle and for them to it's not easy in canada to start some new technique unless there is proper evidence in us they implement this practice very quickly correct so but uh, this paper and there are many such papers with huge number in europe and chinmay will share that paper you can you can always yeah. molin come back yeah tar when Chin, so this technique is not approved fda approved in canada insurance mm. doesn't pay for it in us yeah. also in many center this technique is not approved so like hair transplant and uh, you know weight reduction surgeries people go to mexico for this operation Yeah. Mexico has become a hub because uh, people who have to pay out of pocket it is much cheaper to get it done in Mexico yes. than US. Right, right, right. So there are a lot of things involved. The we are interested in science, you know, because in India, like there are a lot of patients, they don't they don't need a uh, insurance, and we we can do. But if it is really changing the natural course, then we have to do it. 
fine so this was an very uh, illuminating and uh, i mean good paper nicely read chinmay thank you sir let's go quickly to the third paper which is very straight forward but very uh, shalin please share your screen dr shalin is our fellow uh, previous fellow now is in working in uh, wadia children's yeah shalin please yeah. Good, mo good morning, everyone. So today's paper is relation of sural nerve and the medial neurovascular bundle with the Achilles tendon in children with cerebral palsy treated with percutaneous Achilles tendon lengthening. This paper was published in JPO in February 2022, and its uh, origin is from Istanbul, Turkey. So uh, this paper starts with the previous knowledge presented by these uh, highly cited papers. Where the anatomy of sural nerve and its uh, relation to the Achilles tendon has been already been studied, one in cadaveric studies and the other by ultrasound examination, and has mentioned that sural nerve is at risk at the lateral edge of tendon Achilles during percutaneous stenotomies at a higher level. Medial neurovascular structures are also at risk on the medial side, which is known based on the already uh, known anatomy of the posteromedial structures at the ankle. So, uh, with this previous knowledge, they carried out the study to study the anatomic relations of the sural nerve and medial neurovascular bundle to the Achilles tendon and to define the dangerous levels for the injury of these structures, especially in pediatric population. So, uh, previous cadaveric study and uh, clinical study has already mentioned the sural nerve injury presence in one out of 11 cases in lateral, medial, lateral type of cut pattern. And a study by Kranz has reported symptomatic sural nerve injury associated with pain as well as orthosis were in compliance in three out of 30 feet, 20 feet after percutaneous Achilles lemni. So they carried out this a retrospective study in a total of 30 patients uh, by carrying out MRI study of the patients who are operated. So they considered the surgery percutaneous triple hemisection of the tendon Achilles, which was performed. CP children, cerebral palsy children with at least one year of follow-up were included. And uh, the percutaneous Achilles lengthening was performed by the technique described initially by Hatt and Lemphy. So in this technique, they made the first cut one centimeter above the insertion, which is medial. The second cut was three, two to three centimeter above the first cut and the third cut about two to three centimeter above the second cut. And they immobilized the patient post-operatively in a below knee cast for three weeks. So, and in the post-operative MRI scan, which was performed of at least one year of the primary surgery, they tried to measure the distance of the medial neurovascular structures from the medial border of tendon Achilles the lateral sural nerve structure from the lateral border of the Achilles tendon. They tried to measure the insertion to the start of the muscle fiber of the triceps suri and to measure the length of the tendinous structure. And they tried to define which structures at what distance are lying in the danger area. And they defined this danger area as less than five millimeter distance from either of the side of the Achilles tendon. So, they carried out this, uh, they could identify 30 patients who had been operated uh, by this technique and had at least one year of follow-up. Out of these, 25 patients consented for this uh, MRI study. And out of them, 19 patients had adequate imaging of both the ankle, of the ankles which were performed and uh, could be taken for study. So in all, they could get 30 ankles and 19 patients for the study. The average age of the patient in the study was 11.6 years with an age range of 6 years to 18 years. And the mean ten Achilles tendon length they could measure was 80 mm, around 8 cm, with a standard deviation of 2.3 cm. So they studied uh, the cross-sectional imaging of the uh, ankle in this study, and they tried to measure the black arrow measure uh, points the Achilles tendon. And the white arrow points the sural nerve relation laterally. They tried to measure this distance. And when it was less than 5 millimeter at that point, uh, they consider it a danger area. So for the example, in these two cross-sectional imaging, they have mentioned that uh, 
at 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 six centimeters above the insertion, the the distance between these two was nine point eight millimeter, and at two centimeter above the tendon insertion, uh, it was one point sixteen millimeters. And they based on uh, these, they have tried to define the medial danger areas as well as the lateral danger areas. For the medial side, they found that the mean distance between the tendon Achilles and the medial. Shalin, Shalin, can you go back to previous slide? I, I, yeah, can you explain so, the right side figure? What is it? Yeah, actually, they have. Uh, I think they have labeled it wrong. So this would be actually be the ankle plafon, and this would be. Mm nearer to the so this so the be now is away yeah. from tendo achilles near plafond near and the as you go proximally and, it is nearer right yes yes so they yeah. have labeled it wrong but yeah. Uh, yeah so i think it would be easier to understand that as we go above from the insertion they are trying to tell that the sural now comes nearer to the tendon is that and is that yes, more yeah. risk yes. so uh the medial neurovascular structures are fairly away and uh, and none of the distance uh, from one centimeter to eight centimeter, which is the average length of the tendon Achilles in their study, the, could they find the neurovascular structures at risk, which is defined as five millimeters. So the medial neurovascular are fairly safe. However, for the lateral side, they found that as they go above four centimeter, the distance between the sural nerve and the uh, tendon Achilles is reduced to less than 5 mm and which gradually decreases from 4 millimeters to 1 millimeter, uh, one and a half millimeters as they approach the 8 centimeter distance. So they defined that above 4 centimeter from the insertion, the uh, sural nerve is always at risk and we have to be careful regarding this. So they also found that the nerve was enlarged in diameter with degenerative changes in 5 ankles, that is about 16% and completely cut in one ankle, which is 3.3%. In these samples also, the mean distance where the tenotomy was done, uh, the lateral side hemisection was done, was 64 millimeter, which was otherwise 59.6 millimeters. This difference between these two was not significant. Similarly, the mean distance of the sural now to the tendon at this level was only one, uh, one millimeter, with a range of 0 to 2.5 millimeter which was otherwise 2.8 millimeters. However, this difference was also found not to be statistic, statistically significant. So only one patient with a complete cut had actual clinical symptoms. One patient with a complete cut had pain, non-compliance to post of physio and orthosis. However, that also resolved eight months after the primary surgery. So based on this study, they came to the uh, the, the conclusion and discussion that the first three centimeters for the medial, middle lateral hemisection is safe irrespective of the age. The entire medial reg, uh, region is safe for hemisection. And they have compared their uh, study and results to similar studies in adults which are performed or cadaveric studies as well as USD studies which have been performed. And uh, they found that the though the distance correlates with age, the safe region uh, lies within the three to four centimeter on the lateral side. So the tenotomy, the lateral hemisection tenotomy should be performed at two to three centimeter above the insertion, which is a safe region. They have accepted the following limitations in this paper that the small number of cases with a very wide range of age distribution uh, limits the standards of the difference they can be performed. However, they also say that because the varied age group they have in the pediatric population, this uh, numbers can also be standardized because they do not have a very large difference. And they could find that as the age progresses, the distance of the sural nerve from the insertion also increases. And they have performed these MRI uh, only in cases where lending was performed and not in controls. So they could not have adequate controls to compare the results. So these are the issues I have found with the paper. So this paper they have already quoted in their study, which has been published in orthopedics in 2014 which was studied in 68 different patients. And this has uh, defined the various anatomical variations of the sural nerve, which exist. And uh, uh, this V1, V2, and V3 are the three different pathways the sural nerve uh, goes after crossing the tendoculus from the medial to lateral side. These variations have not been addressed in this study. 
the other uh, limitation i found in this study was the mean tendocles length they found was 8 cm however there was a very uh, large standard deviation of 2.5 cm because of the age range they tried to uh, they have told that the they could provide a age related difference however the uh, length of the tendocles in this this study is also a very large difference which would also alter the safe range of the distance from the insertion for these children also the actual clinical outcome they said that the roughly uh, six patients which six, five five ankles which is 16.7% had a sural nerve changes in the mri however only one case who had a complete cut had actual clinical symptoms so we do not know whether this uh, nerve injury or the partial nerve injury which happens would be of clinical significance actually to the patient and the one patient who had uh, actual complete cut did not uh, had had his symptoms resolved in 8 months after the surgery and to minor issues i found with the paper was that they immobilized the child in a belloni cast for 3 weeks uh, they have mentioned that they Uh, carried out the technique which was already been uh, defined and described by uh, the two authors previously mentioned however all of the previous studies immobilized the child in a abony cast after the surgery and uh, the this uh, issue has already been discussed uh, in the previous slide where the there is mislabeling of the images in the published uh, in the published study so in all uh this is a good study and it just uh, reinforces the fact that the uh, 3 cm to 4 cm distance from the insertion is the uh, safe region for lateral hemisection and this is reproducible in the pediatric population also as has been in the adult population cadaveric studies and ultrasonographic studies and they mentioned that this is the first study which has been carried out in cerebral palsy patients as well as in the pediatric population to define the uh safe zone and the safe area thank you right so nicely read i always teach fellows to read a paper like a lawyer and not a doctor because that will help you writing better papers in future when you start writing so this is papers of open for discussion videsha your comments yeah uh, nicely read paper shalin i found this paper definitely useful it is uh, because nowadays we are doing percutaneous lengthening very oftenly and it is good to know the tendoarteritis tendon mapping in relation to sural nerve and the medial neurovascular bundle and to know the safe zone for lateral medial hemisection which should lie within 4 cm from the insertion so it is definitely helpful uh and it is also important to note that uh, you showed one complete uh, uh, rupture or complete transaction of the sural nerve which resolved in 8 uh, months naturally so uh, even if the injury occurs it may resolve on its own looking at this paper so yes yeah so <clears throat> you know few points uh, that's right vidisha Shalin, I would like to bring to notice of all of you that uh, even a single case can change your practice. Yeah, I will give you example of Dr. Peter Waters. While doing one chronic montagia, he had posterior interosseous nerve palsy, and that patient uh, created a lot of issues. and so he started dissecting in br br interval and decompress that nerve and i asked him often that nowhere in world i visited people are dissecting this interval or this nerve why you are doing and he said me this sentence one case can change your practice so where sural nerve always a sensory nerve primarily and its territory is also supplied by other nerves a neuroma can make a child worse painful and you you imagine that what would have happened in during that 8 months of uh, till the time the nerve recovered that the patient would have sued the doctor you know so we have to be very careful about uh, uh, sural nerve injury it's not a, a small issue that's one the problem of Colin, can i comment it's just very one huh, small comment please, please. in all these cases people have been using knives for the hoax procedure 
and the problem is knife has a point and a belly and it's easy to to cut a nerve with a knife uh, yeah. during this procedure you know sometimes you have aberrant variations it's not yeah. necessary that each nerve has read the anatomy textbook and has come you know so there are a lot of variations of radial nerve sural nerve all kind of nerve sciatic nerve which are possible so what we do as a practice since we do a lot of percutaneous uh, myofascial lengthening we use a needle tip and chance of injuring a nerve with a needle tip so that's a great idea taral thanks now i i work with uh, unni narayanan and unni used to do uh, distal to hemi sections percutaneously but the topmost was open a little bit he would put in one or one and half centimeter incision with knife and in subcutaneous he would use an artery and make sure that that nerve is not in the post so the third and most proximal lateral hemi section is a kind of mini open it's not percutaneous and the reason he said that you you have to safeguard sural now so that that uh, observation or, or practice of uni stands right looking at this paper so we should do the prop top most a little open a centimeter incision use your artery make sure that the sural nerve is moved away yeah that is very good input uh, maulin uh, yeah so that will prevent incision to protect the nerve and you can take one or two simple skin stitch that that will help the problem of this paper also is you know uh, as saral mentioned now we routinely harvest sural nerve for brachial plexus thing now so we see the course of nerve is not identical in each case so it might be varying that has not been considered then length of patient would differ so although they have mentioned this average length of this but it may be different some child it would be very small some child would be very long so you you have to be careful about those standard deviations the third thing is if a child is previously operated then the the ratio between tendon and muscle would change so that also should be taken in consideration a previously operated child would have shorter muscle and longer aponeurosis so that point should be taken but there is a very interesting paper you know that uh, it's not an easy operation we have to be careful and uh, and uh, avoid these nerve injuries thanks shalin for a nicely read paper thank you sir so let's go through the quickly to the last paper shinam yes taral says no operation is easy that's right a word from senior colleague and we we took a fibula graft uh, we have presented that case in uh, in tricky case and never in life but i we injured uh, the, this uh, tbl now right shalin and yes, yes, tbl now yes sir tbl artery and yeah. artery yeah. so so whenever you think you can do things easily the god teaches you lesson we are constructing the complex yeah shinam please go ahead and let's be quick hello everyone i am going to talk about modified belfus link application for the treatment of fractures around the shoulder in infants level of study is therapeutic uh, study that is a uh, level 4 study uh, authors are from the uh, our center uh, itself uh, purpose of study is to describe the modified belfus link application technique to assess its acceptability to study the long term outcomes for fractures there were 36 infants who were treated with belfus link application from 2009 to 2018 but 19 infants were included in this study Uh, who had least follow up of 2 years average age uh, was 50 days ranging from 1 day to 7 months least follow up was 2 years and mean follow up was 6 years the uh, uh, for velcus link application a uh, stockinet was used firstly uh, as shown in the picture it was a uh, length was measured from opposite nipple to the affected shoulder 
and then the arm and forearm length of the affected extremity and one and a half times the chest circumference one a small opening was made at the wrist level and then uh, it was fixed with safety pins at the initial and end level example so Shin shinam can you go back to that slide yes this for no wise it will difficult to understand what you mentioned so the first thing is to measure distance a if you can see in figure that's an inverted l starting from the uh, as as china mentioned from the nipple line to the tip of shoulder that's distance a distance b is a true l starting from the point of shoulder to the wrist and the distance c is one and a half times the trunk uh, uh, size which will move around the trunk and we make a small hole as you can see at the wrist level now the distance a is completely cut with a scissor which will roll around the shoulder and come around the shoulder up to the nipple line so uh, so this this part from here to here is cut can you see my marker edisha so from this point we cut it and then the sling is rolled over and the wrist is gently brought out and this uh, the remaining stock in it is turn around it is tied to the arm with a safety pin and this part a is fixed with a safety pin to the wrist level so there are two safety pins as you can see in a in an infant one is fixed here and other is at the mid arm level right yeah go ahead the example of a case uh, which was treated with this application is shown here a patient came to us with shaft of humerus fracture and a uh, sling was velcro sling was applied at 6 years follow up x ray is uh, shown with no malalignment and there was no uh, limb length discrepancy and there were full range of motion outcome measures which were opted uh, in this study were a pediatric adolescent shoulder survey a score and radiological assessment uh, was uh, it was assessed uh, by seeing angular or rotational malalignment and clinically we uh, saw a limb a limb length discrepancy results of uh, there were only two patients uh, who uh, their pass score was 83 all rest patients uh, had pass score of 100 there were no complications except there were a uh, complications seen that were shortening and various angulation in the patients of osteogenesis imperfecta limitations of stud this study was that over that there were uh, there was no control group uh it was studied on a very uh, small population they uh, didn't talk about maximum age limit to which uh, this link can be applied right so uh, one of the limitation is uh, i i have been using this technique uh, since i learned it from sick kids plaster technicians and dr mercer rang has uh, devised this and it was regularly used in sick kids but we found that there is no uh, description of this technique in details and how to apply in literature and so we found that it it would be useful and uh, we very positively it was accepted by journal of pediatric orthopedics american volume and we could publish it and uh, the and so i have we we have been seeing some complication of skin issues or dynaplas related skin issues or some soddening and fungal infection in the axilla when a very rigid sort of uh, sticky materials have been used people have been using microfor or uh, dynaplas or sometimes also plaster and that those bulky things have created problem but 
this uh, splint has an advantage that it uh, relatively immobilizes the extremities and keeps the air ventilation without sticking anything. And uh, the moment we apply the sling, the children become comfortable. The mothers can nurse the babies very easily. And uh, <clears throat> so they all were happy using this and that's why we published it. Small population uh, because some of these patients I have treated in NICUs. And so those patients have not come to my clinic. So I don't have uh, enough follow up, but we have around 19 patients still 2019 and there are more 15 20 more patients so we have huge uh, i mean this this is a simple study we have huge number you know in uh, compared to the subject we did not talk about maximum age limit but we we have limited our study in infants you know uh, we don't want uh, for older children we can use other methods but in infants it's a better way right so uh, with you your comments or any, any questions. Congratulations for this nice presentation. And this is definitely a very good technique. Simple, effective method of immobilizing the baby's arm uh, without harming the skin or the comfort of the baby. And definitely, I will also start using stockinity method. Yeah. So there's one each stock in it and uh, we can share the video how we apply that that will make uh, or some animation that will make it more uh, understandable. So uh, we are concluding today's journal club all were quite stimulating articles very well read all the fellows and uh, consultants. Uh, we this Saturday, uh, we will not have fellows model because the faculties are not available. Uh, and so we will conduct in the mid of the next week. Uh, thank you, Vidisha, for your valued time. Thank you, Maulin. And, yeah, and thanks, Taral, for your uh, time uh, through your busy operative schedule. Thank you, everyone, and see you.